In the name of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Uh, we're delighted to have uh, Fadi and Raus with us here to speak about uh, Saint Athanasius as part of our series, uh, Men of Faith. Very good. But the Fadi, in the name of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Hmm? Yeah, yeah, I got you. Okay, um, so we're gonna we're gonna do a a quick thing today on San Athanasius, um, uh, and I'm just gonna sort of use the names that we call San Athanasius in our church to just like highlight three of the biggest things I feel like we should talk about about San Athanasius, and um, yeah, we'll see how it goes. If you guys have comments, just like yell out and let's have a discussion. Okay. Um, so I just put this quote, also, sorry, I didn't put this into a slideshow, so you're going to look at my, uh, scatterbrain word doc and just bear with me. Okay. So, uh, I put this quote, uh, it's from St. Gregory of Nazianzus. It's actually in his, uh, I think in 380 is in the oration of St. Athanasius that St. Gregory wrote for the, uh, passing of St. Athanasius. He writes, in praising Athanasius, I shall be praising virtue. To speak of him and to praise virtue are identical because he had, or to speak more truly has, embraced virtue in its entirety. He was sublime in action, lowly in mind, inaccessible in virtue, most accessible in intercourse, gentle, free from anger, sympathetic, sweet in words, sweeter in disposition, angelic in appearance, more angelic in mind, calm in rebuke, persuasive in praise, Without spoiling the good effect of either by excess, but rebuking with the tenderness of a father, praising with the dignity of a ruler, his uh, tenderness was not dissipated, nor his severity sour, for the one was reasonable, the other prudent, and both truly wise. And this is really the biggest part, I bolded it. His disposition sufficed for the training of his spiritual children with very little need of words. Um, and I like that. Because when you think of San Athanasius, you think like, oh, this like teenage kid went to a council and yelled at people. You don't think that this is a guy that you're going to describe very little need of words. But when you look at the description of San Athanasius and what he did throughout his life, it was an action based life. And uh, yeah, so hopefully we can learn something from that. Um, and for St. Gregory of Nazianzus to write something so beautiful about him means he was a pretty great guy, which is why we have him as such a like highly esteemed saint in the church. Um, so before we get into him, I just, I, I use this picture a lot, but uh, you can't see the picture at all. Um, Can you zoom in? Yeah, yeah, I'll zoom in. So the picture just kind of places all the fathers in context. Um, so the little blue bars uh, is the early church fathers. St. Paul, St. Peter, St. John, the disciples. Uh, and then we talked about like the apostolic fathers come after the people who take what the disciples did and sort of present it to the first church. They construct the first church. They make these boundaries. Uh, and then you have the green is the apologetic fathers. You talk about Justin Martyr, uh, Irenaeus of Lyons, all these people who now defend the faith. So you got the first people who are formulating the faith. Now you have the people who defend the faith, the apologists, right? And then you have these like Clement, Origen, Tertullian, Cyprian, who are the, the pre before Nicaea. Then you have the Nicene, right? And obviously, St. Athanasius is a Nicene father, right? Uh, with the Cappadocian, like Basil, Gregory, those people, okay? So the context of St. Athanasius is you're after the apostolic fathers, you're after the apologetic fathers, the church is defined, the church has been defended, and now we enter this era of councils, right? And the councils are this era of like defining um, and creating uh, the church and protecting it from schisms, okay? So this is the context that we see that St. Nessius gets born in, right? Um All right, you don't need to see this, but uh, uh, I wanted to just like outline, this is still context, okay? So don't 
don't worry if you're not following. But there's four schools of thought in the early church, okay? There's Alexandria. We all know Alexandria, so no problem. Their school of Alexandria is the allegorical school. It is Everything is allegorical interpretation. Uh, people like St. Clement, Origen, Dionysius, these people write in a way that the Bible is more than just what's written. It's allegorical. It's an interpretation. There's typology. Joseph is a type of Christ. Uh, Adam is the, the, you know, everything is typology and allegory. Okay. That's the school of Alexandria. That's the school that we come from, right? Then you have the school of Caesarea or the Cappadocian fathers. Cappadocian fathers are like St. Basil, St. Gregory, those people. They're Cappadocian fathers. This is the school that was started by Origen. So Origen, he, he leaves, right? He's got a schism, goes over here, makes a new school when he gets excommunicated in Caesarea. And he has this rich extension of Alexandrian theology. These are people like Eusebius, Gregory, Gregory, Basil. Okay, that's these people. Then you have the school of Antioch. You guys can't see that? All of these people have heretic next to their name. Heretic, heretic, heretic. The school of Antioch, you got kind of lost, okay? A little bit lost. They, they're focused on logic, okay? And unfortunately, when you follow purely logic, right, you find that you get lost in a, in a point of time where you can't describe or explain certain mysteries in our church. I would call them mysteries, right? There's certain things you just can't explain. Don't try to explain it. Leave it there. <laughs> just stop. That's the boundary that the school of Antioch pushes, and they always get in trouble. So we always say Nestorius is a heretic, but you know what? His teacher Theodore, his teacher Theodore, his th teacher Diodore, they were all heretics. Don't blame them. Just in a long line of bad teachers, right? Um, and this is important when we talk about St. Athanasius because when you talk about the schism that happened at the Council of Nicaea, a lot of it is because, and we'll get into it in a second, but a lot of it is because Arius is trying to use his logic and say, you know what, it's just not possible that Jesus, that a man, could be God. It's just not possible. So you know what? He was created, right? Uh, his famous line, there was a time when the sun was not. There was a time when the sun was not. He, he thought, you know, there can't be a man who existed at all times. So he must be just a man. And then you start, you ruin the whole trinity, right? Um, so that's the school of Antioch. When you rely on logic, when you use logic more, then you rely on mystery, right? Um, but St. Athanasius, when you read like on the incarnation, he, he, even in on the incarnation, he says, I can't fathom that this God, that this creator came down and he uh, uh, did this on our behalf. He was born in a manger. He was, he was, he was. You can't fathom that this is God, right? And that's okay. You leave it at that, okay? Sorry for the tangent. And then we have the Western, the Latin fathers. These are the uh, the fathers that uh, the Catholics still use, like cite a lot today, like Tertullian, Cyprian, Hippolytus. Uh, they're focused on practical. How do I make Christianity practical? How do I use it in my everyday life? That's the Western school of thought. So those are the four schools. And we find that Athanasius falls in, in the heart, really, of the school of Alexander. Okay? Again, context. All right. Yeah, I left the West. Do you want more? No, that was a very important one. Yeah, I didn't write St. Augustine's name down. I should, I'm going to be a heretic number seven. On no. <laughs> no, no. Just kidding. Okay. So uh, now I'm just going to do three qualities based off the three names or three of the names that we give to St. Athanasius. Uh, the first, we always say St. Athanasius the Great and saints, right? We call him a saint. Um, and there's two points about this I just want to say. St. Athanasius, uh, you, when you're a Christian, you never live in a vacuum. There's no such thing as Christianity in a vacuum. You can't just live at home and pray and find that, oh, I stumbled across Christianity. It doesn't happen. Um, for example, if you have a coal barbecue, you guys remember coal barbecues? So uh, coal barbecue, if you take a piece of coal out of the coal barbecue, throw it on the sidewalk, what's going to happen to the piece of coal? It's going to cool off, right? There's no fire from the coal barbecue unless the coal barbecue is with all the other coals, okay? That's the image of the church, okay? You can't on your own, in your own path, 
be on fire for God. Not because of anything you're doing wrong, okay? But because the the church was was instituted around the fact that we're helping one another and we're keeping each other aflame so that we can come to Christ. Now, Saint Athanasius is a perfect example of this because he lived through the persecution of Diocletian um, when he was younger. 303 to 311 is the beginning of his life. And he knew the martyrs and confessors in Alexandria. He learned what it meant to fight for the faith from a persecution standpoint. Then after that, he also knew um, St. Anthony, and he writes Vita Anthony, the, the life story of Anthony, an incredible book. You should read it. And he writes about St. Anthony's life, and it was said by tradition that they walked together and uh, debated writing on the Incarnation. Like when he wrote on the Incarnation, he wrote it with St. Anthony. He had debated it with St. Anthony. So in Vita Anthony, it says, uh, he's speaking about St. Anthony, but it's great because this is about his life too. It says, and at first he, St. Anthony, began to abide in places outside the village. Then if he heard of a good man anywhere, anywhere in the desert, he found a good man. Like the prudent bee, he went forth and saw him, nor turned back to his own palace until, I think that's place, that's miss, uh, to his own place until he had seen him. And he returned, having got from a good man, as it were, supplies for his journey in the way of virtue. So I think the first thing that we should take away, he's a great man of faith and he's a great defender of the faith because he started using the church institution to learn from people who already had learned and already had advanced in their spiritual life. And like St. Anthony, he goes like the prudent bee, he finds someone who's good. He looks at that person. He says, that person has such a good virtue, takes that virtue from him, applies it to himself on his own path to virtue. Okay. So that's the first uh, big element that we should learn from St. Anthony. Uh, the second is, we call him the apostolic. Why do we call him the apostolic? He's not an apostle, right? Is he an apostle? He's not an apostle, right? So why do we call him the apostolic? Hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he kept true the faith of the apostles. Perfect. Like St. Paul's verse of four generations. Uh, he kept true. He was a faithful man. He took what was given to him by the apostles, gave it to the next people. Um and he always spread the message. Everything he does, you look at the life of St. Athanasius, even when you see his writings. Like his writing on the Incarnation was not, in. it doesn't mention Arianism. It's written as a way to spread the message and to understand and comprehend the mystery that is the Incarnation, right? His All his writings are about spreading the message, are about keeping true the faith, right? And, and not what's popular and not what's popular opinion or politically correct of the time, but what is the truth and how do I preserve the truth and how do I keep it as a, as a sacred morsel for the next generation? Um, he's the first patriarch to write festal letters. Uh, now we get the Pope videos on YouTube. They pop up and we, uh, you know, we read the captions because I don't know Arabic. Uh, but St. Athanasius is the first patriarch to write festal letters. He's reaching out to his congregation. He's trying to spread the message. He's trying to keep the true faith. Right from the Arianism of the time. Um, this is from his festal letter. Festal letter five says, again, the time has arrived, which brings us to a new beginning. Even the announcement of the blessed Passover in which the Lord was sacrificed. We eat, as it were, the food of life and constantly thirsting. We delight our souls at all time as from a fountain in his precious blood. For we continually and ardently desire he stands ready for those who thirst, and for those who thirst, there is the word of our Savior, which in his loving kindness he uttered on the day of the feast, if any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. So you see, he's pointing, he's pointing his own congregation to Christ. And the one thing that's very cool, you also can't see any of this, but the one thing that's very cool, I just pasted like a timeline, okay? You'll see, for example, uh, these three, 333, 334, 335. You see festal letters, festal letters, festal letters. He writes a festal letter every, almost every year. And you find that if you look at the times that he was 
um, banished, not banished, what's the word? That he was in exile, sorry. The times that he was in exile, he still writes a festal letter. So he's off in some desert in Egypt or he's off on some island of Gaul in France and he's sending a festal letter to make sure that his congregation is preserving the true morsel of faith, okay? So first thing we learn, we learn to uh, learn from everybody. We learn that the path to discipleship, the path to, to Christianity is by learning from the people around us in the church and the, the, the pillars of our church. The second thing is we're here to spread. We're here to be apostolic. We're here to, to continue to pass on the faith, okay? Uh, yeah, you see festal letter, festal letter, festal letter. And if you look at when he's in uh, exile, many of these festal letters are during that exile. Okay? That's really all why I pasted all of these years, just to say that. Okay. Um, all right. Now the last one, the uh, most important one, we call him uh, San Athanasius Contra Mundo, uh, against the world, right? We call him San Athanasius against the world. Because he had the courage to stand in front of 318 people at the Council of Nicaea and during his life against Arianism. And he continually uh, uh, fought the true faith even when nobody else believed that, right? Even when no one else was on that path. So if you look at the context of his fighting, okay, um, two popes, so South Nest, Pope number 20, okay? Uh, before him, Pope 17 is St. Peter, Seal of the Martyrs. St. Peter, Seal of the Martyrs, while he's in jail, this is from his Synexarium, says that when Arius found out that St. Peter was on his way out, Arius was exiled, okay? He was in excommunication. He went to St. Peter, and he entreated to St. Peter. He says, please, get me out of excommunication before you pass. And St. Peter's in jail. And St. Peter refuses and says that the Lord had appeared to him this night in a vision wearing a torn robe. And St. Peter asked him, my Lord, who rent your robe? And the Lord rep replied, Arius has rent my robe because he separated me from my father. Beware of accepting it. That's what St. Peter saw immediately before he was martyred, okay? Then we have right after him, St. Achilles, this Pope, the 18th Pope. He was only Pope for six months. And somehow in six months, he couldn't keep Arius excommunicated. He brought Arius back. I don't, you had one job in six months, just keep Arius excommunicated, didn't. He brought Arius back into the church. Arius started to spread again, right? Arianism started to spread again. Then the 19th Pope, you have St. Alexander, right? And St. Alexander looks out his window. You guys know the, the famous story, he looks out his window, sees this little kid baptizing other kids. I don't know where he's baptizing him baptizing other kids, saying the baptism beautifully, like the whole, I don't even know half the baptism, right? I don't know any of the baptism, right? So Athanasius is saying the whole thing. And St. Alexander says, give, give me this per boy, bring him to me. And he becomes the Pope secretary, right? So he becomes a deacon at age 15. And then at age 21, he's a priest. 21, he's a priest. I did nothing at 21. I was useless. I'm probably still paying student debts, right? So uh, this is the context that St. Athanasius goes to the Council of Nicaea. In. Of three popes ago, they're already fighting Arianism, right? So that's the context that he is entering. And he goes to the Council of Nicaea. He's a very young guy, right? Uh, 325, he was what? What's the math? Quick math, 28 or whatever it is. And he goes to the Council of Nicaea, and he's a coffee boy for the pope. Like, he's nobody. He's a coffee boy for the Pope. He's just there to help the Pope. He's just there as a Pope secretary. And in front of 318 bishops, yeah, I, I don't know what, he's listening and he goes, ah, something's not right. There's something not right here. They're discussing something incorrect. And he speaks out against Arianism. That's courage to act. That's courage to speak. Most of us, if my uh, colleagues ask me why I'm not drinking milk, I say, oh, uh, intermittent fasting. I can't even speak out against my colleagues. He's speaking out against 318 bishops that are senior to him. I want you to appreciate how much courage that takes for somebody, right? Um, and as St. Saint, Saint Jerome, he says, the whole world groaned and was amazed to find itself Arian. That's the context that God brings St. Athanasius into to grasp and hold high the banner of orthodoxy. That's why we call him the father of orthodoxy. 
because he's maintaining a true morsel, something that is right, not something that is popular. Um, Y'all uh, roughly know like what Arian said, or you want me to read this quote? Y'all want to spark snow areas, Arianism? Anyone want to spark snow Arianism? Okay, so this is uh, a text from uh, Discourses Against Arianism. He writes for Discourses Against Arianism. This is a text. I just took it as what Arius said. So this is St. Athanasius writing what Arius said. Okay, so you read it. He says, these are the mockeries that Arianism came up with. God was not always a father, but once God was alone and not yet a father. But afterwards, he became a father. You see the logic. That's happening. If we're calling him father, then he must have had a time when it was just a father. Like Baboya, there was a time it was just Baboya, so father must be a time it was just a father, right? Very logical. The son was not always, for whereas all things were made out of nothing, and all existing creatures and works were made. So the word of God himself was made out of nothing. You see where we're going, right? And once he was not, and he was not before his origination, but he as others had an origin of creation. For God, he says, was alone, and the word as yet was not, nor the wisdom. Then wishing to form us, thereupon he made a certain one, like he wanted to make us, so he made somebody else first, right? And wishing to form us, thereupon he made a certain one, and made him word and wisdom and son, that he might form us by means of him. He couldn't create us directly, he made this other guy, okay? Accordingly, he says that there are two wisdoms. First, the attribute coexistent with God. And next, that in his wisdom, the son was originated and was only named wisdom and word as partaking of it. For wisdom says he, by the will of the wise God, had its existence in wisdom in like manner. He says that there is another word in God besides the son. And that the son, again, as partaking of it, is named word and son according to grace. And this, too, is an idea proper to their heresy, as one in other uh, works of theirs, that there are many powers, one of which God's own by nature and eternal but that Christ, on the other hand, is not the true power of God, but as others, one of the so-called powers, one of which named the locust and the caterpillar is called in Scripture not merely the power, but the great power. Uh, is there anything else from this that we need? No. So you see where the logic went. You see where the logic took them, right? That, okay, if the, the there's a father and there's a son, then one is created, right? And you crumble the whole divinity, right? And this is what everybody's believing in Arianism. This is what St. Athanasius, in the context of his fight, right? Um, during that fight, we said he was exiled for 17 years, right? Of the five separate times, 17 years, five separate times, right? And you see the dates here, 339, 346, over, uh, overlay with the festal letter. Um All right. Uh, and the last thing, right? So, so the first, uh, we said three things. Just take away three things. The first thing, live live your Christian life in the church. Live as a pole in a barbecue, right? As St. Athanasius followed the those martyred under Diocletian and, and St. Anthony, follow the great uh, spiritual leaders ahead of you. Read the fathers. Use the fathers when you when you read the Bible, when you try to understand, when you grasp at Christianity, when you're looking at the mysteries, don't use logic. Follow the church. Live in that barbecue. The second thing, be apostolic. Always preach and defend the true morsel. That's the the most important thing that St. Athanasius did in his life. He was true to the true faith of Orthodox. Okay. And the last thing is if it's contramundum, it's contramundum, but you have to uh preserve that faith. Whether it's you again, you have to build that courage, right? And the and the stoicism in Christianity to stay the course and to stay with uh, uh, the faith. So we see this story of San Athanasius. There's uh, soldiers and they're the the they're chasing him down the Nile, right? And they find him on a on a ship and they say, "Hey, do you know where San Athanasius is? Uh, have you seen San Athanasius?" And he answered, uh, "He's not far from me." He didn't lie. He just answered, he's not far from you. You see his demeanor in the face of 
tribulation, right? That's the contramundum demeanor, to stay stable and to stay the course. Uh, yeah, so that's my uh, uh, scatterbrain thoughts on San Athanasius. If anyone has other thoughts about San Athanasius, I definitely didn't even cover 2% of his life. So share, share thoughts about San Athanasius. Go for it. Thank you so much, Freddy. Uh, guys, uh, questions? I'm just going to stop the recording so that you can ask.